Wait, wait, what is there? Yeah, Santanda, you can start. Uh, good evening from India. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to all the participants who attended the lecture by uh, Professor Andrew G. Michael earlier today. For those of you who could not attend the talk, we will upload the entire session in the official YouTube channel of our institute very soon. Let's brace ourselves for another reviting session of knowledge sharing and integration by Professor D. J. Sitaram, the director of IIT Guwahati, who is going to deliver a talk on Attention, characteristics, and seismicity analysis for Himalayan region. The Himalayas represents a spectacle of multiple. I am unable to. I am unable to hear you very clearly. Sorry, sir. Is it, is voice it, is no voice. Answer? Volume. Volume is okay. less. You please increase your volume. Okay. And uh, he's going to, Professor uh, Jesus Sitaram is going to deliver a talk on attenuation characteristics and seismicity analysis for uh, Himalaya region. The Himalaya represents a spectacle of multiple geoscientific observations and have been a study subject of umpteen topics. The strong Himalaya plays a major role in controlling the geodynamics of Northeast India. So I'm keenly looking forward to his lecture. Now, may I request our session advisor, Professor Dapeng Zhao, from the Hope to University Japan to say a few words before our session starts. Over to Professor Dapengo. Hi, uh, I'm very happy uh, to attend this uh, uh, seminar uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I think I can ask you some question after the, the lecture. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Now let me welcome our session chairman, Professor J.R. Kyle, uh, to share his expectations. About the Professor J.R. Kyle. Sir, please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Good evening to all. Professor Shitaram, welcome to this forum. We look forward to hearing from you. The nice lecture on Himalayan region. And I think without wasting any time, I hand over it to, to the anchor. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now let me introduce uh, Professor T.J. Sitaram to our esteemed guests. Professor T.J. Sitaram, has been serving as the director of Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, since July 1st, 2019. He was a senior professor from the Department of Civil Engineering, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, before joining IIT Guwahati. He was formerly a CR professor in the area of energy and mechanical sciences at Indian Institute of Science. He was also the former founder chairman of a center for infrastructure, sustainable transport, and urban planning at IISC. After pursuing a master's in science in geotechnical engineering from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1986, Dr. Sitaram obtained his PhD degree in civil engineering from the University of Waterloo, Canada, in 1991. Further, he served as a research scientist for his postdoctorate work at the Center for Art Sciences and Engineering in the Department of Petroleum Engineering, University of Texas, USA, in 1994. Dr. Sitaram has received many awards and honors for his extensive research and scientific revision. A few notable mentions are Professor Gupal Ranjan, Research Award from IIT Durki, Omuillo and Bhimala Reddy Lecture Award at IRC, etc. Of course, it's a very short bio, and if not for the time constraint, I would have carried on for several more minutes. Now, may I request Professor Sitaram to entertain us with his talk. Over to Professor Sitaram. <clears throat> Thank you. You're, uh, you're able to see my slides? Yes, sir, it is visible. Thank you. All right. So very good, good evening to all of you. 
I know that uh, you have uh, people from across uh, the world. So maybe good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who have joined from elsewhere in the world. First of all, let me thank uh, the Geoscience and Technology Division of the Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, uh, NIST of the SIR, Jorat, for inviting me to this uh, webinar series, our second international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics over uh, during 20th to 30th of September. It itself will show clearly the format of the conferences have changed due to COVID pandemic, and I hope this is going to stay in the future as well. So my association with uh, NIST, particularly uh, with your director, uh, is very close. We do interact quite closely in administration issues. And uh, I also visited your institute a couple of times and seen the work, what is going on in a multidisciplinary R&D work relevant to the, particularly the Northeast of India. And, uh, so the geoscience and technology, the division of your group, he is actually quite involved in monitoring the seismicity of Northeastern Division. And I'm very happy to say that IIT Guwahati um, recently started a Center for Disaster Management and Research group. We have a Master's in Disaster Management and a PhD in Master's so I welcome some of you to look at that programs and also both in terms of contributing as uh, collaborators and uh, also maybe some of you are interested to further your knowledge, you can also take a look at that. I'm also very happy to tell you that this uh, event, what you have organized, have attracted, you, have attra you are able to attract a very large number of scientists working in the seismology and tectonics. And it's very appropriate uh, to have it uh, in this part of the world. And yesterday, I think many of you noticed it, midnight, around one o'clock in the night, there was an earthquake uh, in this region. And at least in Guwahati, we all felt it. It was uh, quite a large one. So before I move into my talk today, which uh, the title of my talk is Scrutiny of the Attenuation Attributes and a Seismic Evaluation of the Himalayan Region. Friends, uh, myself, you know, and my students have worked in this uh, in the last about uh, 20 years. Large number of PhD students have graduated on these topics uh, at the Art Institute of Science, Bangalore. And as you know, about 59% of the land area of the Indian subcontinent has high chances of moderate to severe earthquakes, of which Himalayas are the most seismically active. Regardless of the high seismic activity, the seismic network in the region is largely insufficient. I will show you also what network we have and designs incapable of safely resisting include motion. A seismic zonation, whether it is micro or macro or even intermediate one, estimation of peak ground acceleration at bedrock level and ground level is important to understand the seismic hazard in the region. For this uh, region setting, wave propagation characteristics and specifically the ground motion prediction equation are very, very critical and they should be generated. Considering the tectonic setting, wave propagation characteristics, fault and rupture characteristics and side effects based on the recorded or synthetic strong motion data. So this is a very well known and large number of exercises has happened in this area. So in today's talk, I'm going to highlight to you, particularly both in the North Center Himalayas and also the Northeast Himalayas, which is very, very critical. I also happened to be the president of Indian Society of Earthquake Technology. And recently we had a very uh, large international conference where almost close to about 1,400 people attended, which was on the geotechnical earthquake engineering where this particular aspect of local site effects and other issues, including hazard, uh, seismic hazard assessment, were covered extensively 
and in addition to that liquefaction and other aspects were also talked about. Some of our contribution in the last uh, 20 years, as I told you, uh, myself and my students, the first one is the earthquake hazard assessment for the India and adjacent regions. This is a book in CRC Press and uh, comprehensive seismic zonation scheme for regions at different scales where we talked about micro, macro and intermediate scale. And also, you know, we have given us some clear guidelines of how to and what kind of uh, geotechnical investigation, geotechnical and geophysical investigations one needs to carry out to comprehensively, you know, zone, zoning the scheme, so the zonation schemes for regions, you know, different regions with the different populations. And we have considered both the hazard as well as the population. And from outside, we thought that in India, we need to prepare people, the public particularly. So we have talked about how to prepare for an earthquake. There's another book in Springer series. So in this particular talk, I would like to thanks to my colleagues, particularly Dr. Ramakrishnan, who graduated from Indian Institute of Science. And presently, he is at Amruta Vishwa Vidya Peetam as an assistant professor. And Dr. Srival Sakolatayar, who was my PhD student in 2014, and he is presently an assistant professor at uh, NIT Suratka, NITK, we call. I would like to thank both of them. In addition to that, you know, particularly for their contribution to this work, this work was carried out at the Department of Civil Engineering, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, more than IIT Guwahati. So this today's talk I have divided into five six components, briefly introduce the problem, then I define the scope of the work for this particular presentation and the methodology adopted along with the GMP development, this ground motion attenuation, ground motion prediction equations uh, development and also we using that new de newly developed GMP, we carry out both uh, the deterministic and probabilistic hazard analysis for the both the North Central Himalayas uh, and uh, Northeastern Himalayas separately. Uh, you know why we are doing that because the tectonics are quite different in these two areas. So finally, I'll conclude from this work. So let us first to take you to what are attenuation relationships, our ground motion prediction equations are basically the relationships which provides a means of predicting the level of ground shaking and its associated uncertainty at any given site or location based on earthquake magnitude, source to site distance, local soil conditions, fault mechanisms, etc. GMPs are basically you know, efficiently used to estimate uh, the ground motions for use in both deterministic and probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Friends, you know, all of you know that the Berkeley group has done a setup, very, you know, fantastic team to work on the global ground motion prediction equation program. So I would like to, those who are young and would like to look at how to, what kind of GMPs are available, I would uh, like you to refer the peer.berkeley.edu global GMP equations, where the building of the most recent advances in the field the Global Ground Motion Prediction Equation Program has gathered a distinguished international team of experts in Berkeley. We use a unified, transparent, and collaborative approach to select a harmonized suite of ground motion prediction equation. What I would like to tell you is ours is not in that level because we have the data, the, uh, the local data of uh, the Himalayan uh, seismology. Uh, so based on our information, we have done this. So it may not be to that extent. So I just wanted to caution you before itself. So the next step part is, you know, this area uh, in here, what we talk about. There are very few region specific GMPEs for the Himalayan region. Uh, very recently, about 10 to 15 years, people started working in this region with the regional data, with the critical magnitude and distance limitations. All of them suffer from some limitations, either magnitude, uh, because there are not many large earthquakes have happened in this region in the last hundred years, and the distance limitations also is there. <coughs> a region specific GMP and a comprehensive seismic hazard assessment of the Himalayas is crucial need of the hour. It's very very important considering the high seismicity and seismic gap of the Himalayas. 
I will have explained to you what seismic gaps I'm talking about. Okay, and uh, there are uh, very specifically, I could say, even our codes are not yet looking at this very carefully. Or ISA 1893, which is actually an earthquake code, which is used extensively, doesn't look at very seriously these issues. So we have only the documents like National Disaster Management Authority's document in 2010, where you know some of these aspects have been touched. But what is important is this area is actually suffered by 2005 Kashmir earthquake, uh, earthquake 7.6 in NW scale, and uh, caused the almost close to 80,000 deaths. And then 2015 Nepal earthquake on the right side, what you're seeing in the picture, which is also 7.8 mega MW earthquake, uh, close to about 9,000 people killed. And, but uh, the loss of economic loss was so huge, close to about 10 billion, 10 billion US dollars. Serious limitations of the existing zonation and seismogram network. Okay, please note, there are two aspects. One is existing zonation itself, there is a limitation, which we have because my code for codes doesn't talk about it and then we do not have enough number of seismograms so that uh, we have a serious limitation of handling this problem in this in this region the region requires a revised zoning based on a scientific seismic hazard and a better seismogram network seismic hazard of a region is estimated in terms of peak ground acceleration during an event for which ground motion prediction equations are the most decisive input I think I don't need to say this to this audience. I am very sure all of you know this. Previous hazard assessment of the region and zonation are based on the GMPEs developed for other regions. Or we go and pick it up from the Berkeley group of a similar geology and similar region and start using that. That's where we have a real issue. Let me tell you our study area is, as I told you, both north center himalayas and northeast himalayas so both we have separated it out because tectonically seismo tectonically both are different regions so we are trying to develop the gmpes for the north central himalayas as shown in the left side that is the region and north east himalayas including where we are located in Guwahati, assam and then other seven sister states okay which are located on the northeastern state. So what I would, uh, these pictures, what I have shown you here is, is uh, some major earthquakes which have happened and also the boundary of our national region because we didn't want to go, get into controversy of analyzing other countries. So we haven't really looked at the, uh, the nations which are neighboring to us, our country. So we have only focused on India, you can see, uh, very clearly the maps are showing them. So different GMPEs and synthetic ground motion for the North and Northeast India are being developed, uh, uh, sorry, have been developed separately using actual recorded strong motion data. That's what I'm going to show you. The differences in the tectonic setting of North and Northeast India calls for developing uh, separate region specific GMPEs and synthetic ground motion for both regions. The high seismicity of the North and Central Himalayas is attributed to the Northeast trending Indo-Australian plate and its collision uh, and its collision uh, tectonics with the Tibetan Eurasian plate. So all of you, all of us know that and the recent uh, I think nature paper in 2005, the GRI team has clearly said that you know our uh, the peninsula of India is a very thinnest plate and it is it is the moment of this plate is quite fast. It is hitting the, the seismicity of the Northeast Himalayas are more complex. See, this uh, part is much more complex than the, the, the North Central Himalayas. So, this is attributed to juxtaposed the collision tectonics between the Northeast trending Indian plate, that is the Northeast trending Indian plate and the Eurasian plate in the North and the subduction tectonics along the east-west trending Arakana Yoma belt in the indo myanmar region in the east. So with the development of national strong motion instrumentation network, which I'm going to show you in the coming slides, in India, ground acceleration due to earthquake events have been recorded and has been made available, but they're all of recent nature. 
This data basically can be effectively used to develop region specific GMPEs, use it for seismic hazard analysis, analyze the time frequency components, and develop synthetic ground motion for the north, northern, and northeast Himalaya separately. So, let me go into the next slide. See, what I have plotted here is actually this picture is uh, uh, refers to Bilham's a 2019 paper, Bilham et al. So, basically, what it shows is the slip potential on the vertical axis okay, along the region. So, the, this is a five century of Himalayan rupture zone. Okay, uh, that means of close to about 500 years. The current slip potential meter scale, right? This is the data provided by uh, this is the basically picture itself is of Bilham et al. 2019. So where clearly you can see uh, the slips of the range of almost 10 meters. What I would like to highlight to you is the past earthquakes have happened in the central uh, this thing and the, the orange colored one, which are the brown shading, you know, could rupture close to about more or more than MW 8.4 earthquakes. There are six regions, one, two, three, four, five, and six regions. These six regions, Okay, uh, clearly based on the current slip potential in meters, okay, you can see close to six meters to more than 10 meters. Since the last rupture in name segment has happened uh, in the last five centuries, if you look at it, the colors indicate a maximum magnitude of an earthquake that could occur in the present time should a segment fail in a single event or as a partial slip. So two areas with violet shading would host MW greater than 8.7 earthquakes. Okay. These, these are the two areas in violet color. Okay, in the central gap as well as in eastern Bhutan, we can uh, have 8.7. Six areas with brown shading, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, are with 8.4 magnitude earthquakes. Okay, so basically these are what are called as seismic gap in the region. So there is no earthquake you can see. After 1505, there was no earthquake in the central gap and also the Bhutan area, as well as many of these areas are very old, 1714, and uh, only in 1934, that is the Bihar the earthquake, and 1950, if you look at it, was the Assam earthquake, 1947, was, I think, uh, the Meghalaya earthquake. So the seismic gap, a segment of an active plate boundary, that relative to rest of the boundary has not recently ruptured and is considered to be more likely to produce an earthquake in the future. So this is what we, gap, we call it as a definition of a seismic gap. The Himalayas are actually even, it's been recorded very recently, are rising at a rate of 5 to 20 millimeter per year due to the collision of the Indian and Eurasian plate. I don't need to give references here because all of you know this is a common community. Katri is also, there are many Indians also have done the work on how the, uh, the rate of due to collision is happening. The collision have caused several major earthquakes all along the 2,500 kilometer Himalayan mountain belt. Most devastating past earthquake in the region include Kangra, MW 8.6. Okay, you can see that actually in you know, some of those colors. Bihar, Nepal, 1934, MW 8, Assam, 1950, MW 8.7, Uttarkasi 1991, MW 7.1, Chamoli uh, 1999, MW 6.5, Gorkha Nepal 2015, MW 7.2, etc. They can go on. Four earthquakes with magnitude exceeding 8 have occurred in the Himalayas in the span of 53 years between 1897 and 1950. So, how are our core, existing core, which is uh, uh, after 2016, okay, part one, is still based on delineates different seismic zones based on the past seismic activity and is getting revised from time to time. Last being in 2016. Actually, most of our code, we wake up every major earthquake and say we have to revise it, but still we haven't really brought the probabilistic seismic hazard into our code. It does not provide a quantified seismic hazard for each region but lumps large part of the country into unstructured regions of the equal Region-specific GMPEs are critical for developing a scientific 
hazard map that is what we focused in our work today so even with seismic design codes even with seismic design codes and advanced construction practices recent earthquake like the 7.8 magnitude gurkha earthquake in 2015 have caused large losses to life and property so as i told you earlier the fatalities may be lesser when compared to the kashmir earthquake but that is maybe because of population density injuries have about financial losses over 10 billion us dollar was reported in the gorkha earthquake as i told you earlier so you can see some of the major earthquakes in india and adjoining regions in the recent past clearly indicating that uh, that uh, that the, there are some of the gaps seismic gaps and existing uh, you know where large earthquakes can occur and the existing zonation in is core is not enough the projected damage of future earthquakes can be devastating so we need to develop a very more scientific based of gmps and then a proper hazard zonation map has to be developed so let me now take you to the national strong motion instrumentation network of india before that let me define numbers from the table clearly advocate that need to keep the updating the current knowledge and construction practices to aid in curbing these losses the knowledge of earthquake its processes and dynamics have to be continuously kept in the limelight of the researchers the research further construction practices seismically active areas need to be revamped with proper codal revisions and provisions strict enactment of these provisions so let me bring you to the national strong motion instrumental network of india iit roorkee actually deployed something like uh, 298 digital seismographs covering the northern and central himalayas okay this is what we call kangda array and uttar pradesh array and then northeast himalayas and the southern alluvial plains of the delhi region northeast indian we call shilang array map showing this is the iit roorkee to the professor sharma's work later uh, this was uh, replaced by a total of 298 uh, digital seismographs covering the northern and central himalayas and northeast himalayas which i showed you here by kumar et al 2012 2012 so wherein digital seismographs covering northern and central himalayas northeast himalayas and southern alluvial plains so we are now going into southern alluvial plain also to put our instrumentation which is a very good thing all these data is currently made available by the national seismological center at asmas.in okay but somehow you know there was a break in between you know in the asmas data also but data of event between 2005 to 2014 can be obtained from the asmas website the data from the analog seismographs between 1985 to 1991 and after 2014 can be obtained from center for engineering of strong motion data and the virtual data center of the consortium of organization for strong motion observation system cosmos so there are lot of you know data we try to look at together and then you know come with a solution so in this presentation i'm going to look at the scrutiny of these attenuation attributes based on the actual uh, measured data okay of the strong motion instrumentation network of india and develop a region specific gmp is considering the actual recorded strong motion data using you know i just wanted to tell you using total of 33 earthquake events with a total of 278 data entries ranging from moment magnitude of 4.1 to 7.8 and hypocentral distance of 16 km to 1560 km for north central himalayas similarly for the northeast himalayas total of 25 earthquake events with a total of 200 data entries ranging from moment magnitude of 4.2 to 6.9 and a hypocentral distance of 42 km to 640 km for northeastern himalayas you can see that the distance range is very small so we try to develop based on this actual data a comprehensive and reliable seismic hazard analysis of the region after developing the attenuation attributes of the specific region specific gmp the scope of work is you know uh, i will not go and read this collection of recorded strong motion development of a seismic tectonic map valuation of the seismicity parameters a and b and seismic hazard assessment considering both the deterministic and a probability what i would like to say here a larger data set is reasonably now available uh, it's better but it is not really complete so you want to develop a better and more reliable gmp we require much more larger data set 
However, lack of availability of further data on the fault characteristics in the information what has been provided uh, by the uh, GSI, rupture characteristics, etc., which abstain us from developing a more complex new generation of remediation relationship, what we call as NGA, like the uh, Berkeley group. So we do not have actually the information on the fault characteristics, rupture characteristics, and most of these, uh, we need to develop such data as well. So as I told you in this, uh, with this, so North Central Himalayas and Northeastern Himalayas are dealt separately due to more complex tectonic setting of the Northeastern uh, Himalayas, Northeastern Himalayas, but also the data also Northeastern Himalayas is smaller for us. Estimating the seismicity parameter of the region helps in delineating the region to various seismic source zones for better estimation of hazard using KSHA. So the methodology what we have adopted is shown in the next slide, where you know we recorded acceleration data, magnitude, epicenter location for developing a new GMPE, okay, source suicide distance model selection and fitting. Okay, we develop a new GMPE and then we use the earthquake data and data homogenization and seismotectonic map. Okay, and do the seismic hazard analysis both using uh, the deterministic or probabilistic and develop peak ground acceleration. And once peak acceleration data is available, development of PGA contours and georeference shape file of the region, we develop the seismic hazard map for the north central Himalayas and northeast Himalayas. So this is the methodology, the whole methodology what we have adopted. And that means we have developed the GMPEs based on the actual data, what we have I just shared. And then once we have done that, so we also estimate the peak ground acceleration using the GMPE okay, for that region. And then uh, based on the deterministic hazard analysis, as well as probabilistic hazard analysis, we calculate the peak ground acceleration data and the contours of that develop the system. So the development of GMP for Northeast uh, North Himalayas uh, general form is shown here. The regression model preferred for the analysis here is the Campbell's equation. Okay. So I would like to say here the ground motion attenuation relation gives the variation of peak ground acceleration as a function of earthquake magnitude and source to side distance. The rate at which the amplitude of waves generated during an earthquake get amplified and deamplified as it travels through the distance in a particular region, which can be found by means of attenuation relationship. So that's what is shown here. Where y here, y log y is the horizontal or vertical peak ground acceleration, and f1 to f f2, f3, f4 are basically functions of the properties expressed in brackets. That is the magnitude. Okay, like that, and then. Uh, M is the magnitude or R is the distance from event to the recording station. E represents the tectonic environment. F represents the fault type. And epsilon is a term which you have to carefully look at. It is a random variable representing of any uncertainty in log y. So the regression model preferred for the analysis here is the Campbell model. That includes F1, F3, F4, but excluding the tectonic term of this, okay, which is F2. The nonlinear regression we have adopted does assume the developing the donation relationship okay, by others. So these are some of the things what we have done in this case. And as I just told you, I'll repeat what I showed you. These are the events which we have considered total of 33, 33 earthquake events with a total of 278 data entries ranging from moment magnitude of 4.1 to 7.8. This is for the North Central Himalayas. Okay, please understand. Seismotectonic map of North Central Himalayas showing all the faults as well as the events. So you can see most of the events are in the foothills of Himalayas. So hypocentral distance of 16 to kilometers to 15, 60 kilometer, which was available what we have used. Okay. So the next uh, is the what the decay parameter what we have chosen. Magnitude distance start shows the magnitude distance that uh, shows that the gaps in the data in terms of magnitude and distance, which are uh, reasonably, you know, comparatively less when compared to the previous studies, I can say, okay, as large data set is now basically available, but we still feel that we require some more data set. 
So the bottom figure, what I showed you here, shows the, how the new JMP compares with the past equation and its capability to predict ground motion at a larger distance compared to past equation. So now we can go up to or close to about um, 500 kilometers, okay, almost like 600 kilometers we can go. So this work was published in the Journal of Earthquake Engineering very recently in 2019. So the, the original recorded uh, data for the Nepal-India border earthquake we have taken and inserted that. This is the new GMPE, the dots, okay. And then uh, the, the original recorded data of Nepal-India border earthquake of April 4th versus PGA predicted using new GMPE and previous GMPEs we have plotted here. And the top figure basically shows how well the new GMPE predicts an actual ground motion at larger distances. We have also compared with other you know, authors, GMPEs, Maybe for some other reason, some some of them, Sharma, for example, for this region, not for India, in a broader sense. So the bottom figure basically shows the percentage residuals of predicting the same uh, event using the new GMP and the GMP by NDMA and Sharma. So what we can clearly see is the, our new GMP is here. The percentage residuals are smaller when compared to the NDMA results. The values are much closer to zero when compared to the past DMPs. We can confidently say that. The next slide, basically, the similar approach was for the followed for the northeastern Himalayas, showing the seismic sources, recording stations that event considered. We can see the recording stations of the event considered, event considered for developing GMPE. Here, a total of 25 earthquake events were considered with a total of 200 data entries. And this paper has been presented at uh, the 16th Symposium of Earthquake Engineering at Indian Society of Earthquake Technology at IIT Roorkee in December 2018. And, and uh, based on the, uh, the analysis of this, the hazard analysis, the DK parameter is uh, listed here. So the PGA predicted the top picture shows the magnitude distance chart shows that the gaps in the data in terms of magnitude distance are very less uh, when compared to the previous studies. But however, as I have to caution you that we do require some more data here to be much more elegantly presentable uh, analysis. So, however, the bottom figure based on the available data shows that the new GMP compares reasonably well with the past equations and its capability to predict the ground motion at a large distance compared to the past equation close to 600 kilometers is very shown in this plan. So, the original uh, recorded uh, Event. The top figure shows how well the new GMP predicts the actual ground motion at larger distances than what is possible with old GMPs. So we have shown up to 250 with original uh, data. Bottom figure basically shows the residuals, percentage of residual predicting the same event using the new GMP and GMP of NDMA or Sharma and uh, Mungan 2006. Okay, the values much closer to zero when compared to the past GMP. So then, then, you know, we took up the seismic hazard analysis where again the steps are very clearly laid out here for you. We have taken you know, 0.5 kilometer by 0.5 kilometer of the grid data development for the seismic tectonic atlas. Both the DSHA and PSHA using the new GMP has been analyzed. The DSHA basically a conservative approach considering uh, uh, the worst case scenario earthquake uh, no uncertainty is considered here. There is such a more realistic approach considering various uncertainties and probabilities of occurrence of events over various time periods. And finally, a new updated seismic hazard map for the whole Himalayas was developed for the both North Central Himalayas and Northeast Himalayas based on this procedure, what I have laid out here. So the earthquake catalog, you can see it here. Numerous agencies have actually uh, have contributed considering like United States Geological Survey, USGS, Northern California earthquake data. So please note that after the GMP is developed, we have taken the events from across the world, from all the uh, sources for our probabilistic and deterministic hazard analysis. So that means a final combined catalog since 250 BC, 87,426 earthquake events was considered. And in this, all the procedures were done. Please note that. That is, uh, we have homogenization and declustering of earthquake data was done. 
any repeatability also has been removed. All that has been done very elegantly, and it has been vetted by uh, the noted uh, seismologists also given comments when we published this data. And also, as I told you, uh, this is my maybe our 20th PhD student working in this area. United States Geological Survey data we have taken North. Northern California Earthquake Data Center, NCEDC, National Earthquake Information Data, NI, NEI, NEIC, and International Seismological Center Data, ESC, National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, NEHRP Data, Indian Metrological Department Data, also have been considered and put it here. Okay. So then, you know, we I will show you homogenization declustering. So we have basically taken MW magnitude if events considered. The earthquake catalog should have a uniform magnitude scale. So we have converted all into the uniform size. The earthquake data provided by different agencies will have a different magnitude scales like body wave, surface wave, local magnitude, moment magnitude, all are converted to, and even the, some of them are intensity scale, all of them converted to MW. So because the reason is ML, MS, and MB scale saturate at different levels for large earthquakes and do not behave uniformly for all magnitude ranges, often resulting in incorrect estimation of earthquake magnitudes. That's why we adopted MW. So, but uh, sir, you have converted them. Yes, of course, we have used the equations to convert to MW. These limitations are overcome with the moment magnitude scale, which is based on the scalar seismic moment of Kanamori et al. Kanamori 1977. The homogenized earthquake catalog might contain the four shocks and aftershock of the main event, along with some repeated data they collected from various sources. So the, the next is seismic source map and models. I will not get into the details, but as I say, three seismic sources were considered. That is linear, point, and gridded, so that you know uncertainties are captured. Fault locations were identified from SISAT. Okay, this is the GSI uh, information. That's where I told you we didn't have complete information for some of the faults, showing the location of faults, shear zones, lineament and basically linear sources. To overcome the limitation of linear sources, point source and graded seismicity models also considered along with linear sources I did from that class. So this is all published in the Journal of Earthquake Engineering in 2019. So the seismotectonic map was prepared. This is the map which you can see both North Central Himalayas and North Eastern Himalayas of the region. So, uh, which is a representation of the seismic features in an area like faults, liniments, and shear zones, along with all the past earthquake events that happened in and around these seismic features. A buffer area of 300 kilometers was considered as per USNRC 1997. We are 300 kilometers we have taken, so that that is why we have gone beyond the boundaries. The earthquake events were pre-processed to check for uniformity of magnitude, repetition of events, core shocks, aftershock before developing the map. Please note that these maps doesn't have repetition of events. Okay, four shocks are removed, after shocks are removed. Well, to as much as possible using the uh, present standard methodologies what we have adopted. And the 300 kilometer bound from the boundary, a buffer area was also considered for the analysis. I will try to conclude very quickly. These are the delineation of regional seismic source zones of North and Central Himalayas and their characterizations. So we have also not taken one, one zone. We have divided them into several zones. Okay, that's what I'm going to show you here. So uh, where there is a more events, you know, we have called it as one zone, two, three, four. So like that, you know, we have done where the parameter A and B depict the productivity of a volume or slope of the frequency magnitude distribution, respectively, which represent the seismic activity and relative size distribution of earthquake events in the region. That is Gutenberg Richard of 1956. So then, you know, we followed DSHA, which is a rather straightforward approach using the seismic activity and geologic setting of the site uh, to identify the largest earthquake each source can produce irrespective of time. This largest possible earthquake related to a source from the history are assumed tectonic action is called the maximum credible earthquake. So based on this maximum critical, pro, credible, credible earthquake, this approach provides the most critical earthquake scenario considering the magnitudes of the events from the point and linear sources within a buffer area of 300 kilometers. The SHA, on the other hand, considers the GR parameters to characterize the region into various seismic source zones based on the A and B value. So, in this, uh, uh, this is for the uh, north central Himalayas. 
So northeastern Himalaya similar approach was adopted. The seismicity of the northeast Himalayas are more complex and is attributed to the juxtaposed subduction tectonics along the east-west trending uh, Arakan Yoma belt in the Indo Myanmar region in the east and the collision tectonic between the northeast trending Indian plate and the Eurasian plate in the north. So, this uh, uh, we can say that 1987 earthquake is the one is the what we call Assam earthquake of 1897 occurred on 12th June of 1897 in Assam at 515 IST in an estimated of MW of 8. Okay. It resulted in approximately 1,500 human casualties because that time the populations in this area were also less and also the kind of infrastructure was also very, you know, light structures were there. So it does not cause a lot of casualties, human casualties. So as I told you, the building, I mean, as always, as an engineer, we tell you, buildings don't kill people. It is the, you know, it is the structure, sorry, buildings. It is it is not the earthquake doesn't kill people, it's the buildings. Do. So. When these buildings are lightly loaded structures, then automatically, you know, there's not much damage will much. People are killed. Human casualties will be less. So this earthquake resulted in Shillong Plateau being thrust violently upwards by about 11 meters. The fault was about 110 kilometers in length, <coughs> while the fault slip was about 18 meters. 1915 earthquake was almost in the northern part of Assam, northeastern. So the 1950 Assam-Tibet earthquake, what we call Assam earthquake also, on 15th August, I had an MW of 8.6. The epicenter was located in Mishimi Hills, known as Chinese, known in Chinese as the Qingong, uh, Qilingong Mountains, occurring on a Tuesday evening at 7.39 p.m. The event was destructive in both Assam and, it, and Tibet. Approximately 4,800 people were killed. The earthquake is notable as being the largest recorded earthquake caused by the continental collision rather than subduction and is also notable for the loud noises produced by the quake and reported throughout this region. Large loud noises were. So the maximum magnitude observed. So here DSHA based on maximum credible earthquake as I told you earlier in the region close to the site, which is basically the greatest earthquake uh, sources in the region can produce, which can be realistic or anticipated. It considers the worst scenario uh, by assuming critical magnitude earthquake to occur at closest possible distance. So you can see the max estimated for each fault by two methods are also adopted. There were reasonable and Kijko Selville method was adopted. Complete catalog might not be able to predict this maximum magnitude event for any given seismic source. This upper limit of earthquake magnitude a source can produce is termed as the maximum magnitude or a max. Apart from the observed maximum magnitude, a max absolute associated to each seismic source model, the maximum magnitude for each source and max should be estimated by various other methods as well. So coming to the third analysis, as I told you, we carried out a DSHA probabilistic. So we have written our own programs, which was verified with the standard programs as well. And we have discretization of the entire study into 0 0.05 degree, 0 0.05 degree, 5 kilometer by 5 kilometer. PGA at the center of each grid was estimated using region-specific GMPEs, which developed earlier. And then the total number of so many grid points were there created for DSHA of the North and Central Himalayas and 36,000 grid points were Northeastern Himalayas. So the map was uh, produced here, and this is, uh, is going to appear in Journal of Earth System Science, which is already in press. It means it's accepted and in press. So here, DSHA yielded bedrock level PGO values up to the range of 0.4 to 0.7 G in the North Central uh, Himalayas and 0.6 to 0.8 G, that means in the North East Himalayas, with the peaks observed towards the plate boundaries with a decreasing trend towards the peninsula of Egypt. That's very clear and very obvious to us that it is basically a plate boundary for the events are happening. For the North Central Himalaya, we have carried out similarly probabilistic seismic hazard analysis with 2% of accidents and also 10% of accidents. The maps very clearly shows that 10% and 2% probability of accident, considering the average of both source models for the North Central Himalayas. Similarly, for the uh, Northeastern Himalayas, so where we are observing 0.2 to 0.4 G around the plate boundary region and uh, the PGA's value is 0.2 to 0.4 G. 
So what we can see very clearly is the DSHA actually produced much, much higher PGA values than DSHA. Finally, to conclude, the new GMPs could closely, um, you know, more accurately predict the recorded PGA than the previous equations, which can be attributed to the larger data set of purely recorded data with a good distribution of magnitudes and hypocentral distance. The hazard map developed using the new GMP shows high hazard in most of the Himalayan region as compared to the suspect zonation delineated in IS 1893. That clearly shows that, you know, we need to relook at some of these, even in the probabilistic hazard, we have a much higher uh, peak ground acceleration. A revision of the existing zoning and uh, uh, zonation based on design parameters is recommended, along with the strict implementation of the safer design and construction practices in the light of high seismicity, and especially in the seismic gap in the region. So the new GMPs could be used over larger magnitude and distance ranges in comparison, and were able to predict ground motion to large distances more accurately. Quantitative assessments showed that new, new GMPs are more accurate and residuals generated in predicting the PGA were much lesser than the widely adopted region-specific GMPs. The new GMPs also had a standard error term, which enabled them to be used in probabilistic hazard assessment. So using these, you know, what we have carried out clearly highlights that, uh, that we have to look at safer design and construction practices in the light of high seismicity and the seismic gap in the region. So thank you very much. And some of our uh, books, you know, if you are interested, these are all the earlier books on geotechnical applications for earthquake engineering. A lot of these hazard analysis were also carried out. And these are the recent, you know, seventh international conference on geotechnical earthquake engineering. Uh, the proceedings are also, which happened only in the month of uh, July of 2021. And all these are available on online. Some of them are still freely accessible to you. Uh, you know, some of you can look at it, you know, which we have brought it out. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all my collaborators, the funding agencies, and also the Indian Society for Quick Technology, the IIT Guwahati and Institute of Science. So thank you very much, sir, okay. for your uh a uh, very beautiful, very important talk topic on hazard analysis through development of ground motion prediction equation for a particular uh, Great Himalayas. Uh, this type of study would be very much helpful for Arctic hazard analysis uh, for sure. And we'd like to uh, collaborate with your Center for Disaster Management uh, and Research of IIT Guwahati uh, for research uh, for different kind of research activities. Now, may I request our session. Uh, uh, advisor, Professor Dateng Zhao, if he has anything uh, to say uh, about the Professor Dateng Zhao. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very nice talk and uh, the results are very uh, exciting. I just have a question uh, that in your, uh, in your uh, estimation of the seismic hazard map, did you take into account the crustal structure? For example, attenuation and uh, seismic velocity variations. I'm unable to hear your questions very clearly, sir. You have to little bit speak to the mic. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in your seismic hazard estimation, did you take into account the cross structure? such as the distribution of seismic attenuation and the seismic velocity and other information? No, I think I've explained to you, I haven't done that, okay? See, what we have done is we have uh, followed a very standard uh, hazard analysis, okay? Okay, I see. So, and uh, you, you could see that, you know, we have, what we have done is we have developed a new GMPE, okay? That is one part of it. The next is we have uh, basically based on a gridded seismicity model, we have calculated based on the known GMP using the known GMP and the events from all the events. Now the events are larger set. It is not like the what uh, we had uh, done earlier. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm a kind of a structure geologist, 
and uh, I have been studying uh, the three-dimensional structure of the crust and the mantle. I think uh, there are some studies in the study region, in your study region, about the the Q tomography, crust velocity tomography, something like that. No, we haven't done that. I told you, we, we haven't gone into that details of uh, see uh, the. I, I did tell you that that is our limitation of the study. That is why we couldn't do, do like uh, uh, the Berkeley group. Okay, it is uh, okay. <laughs> it is not that uh, we haven't done that. We didn't have the data at all. See, please understand, we are all engineers. We do not have that data with us. So even the GSI, GSI data which we had was very limited data. Okay, on the fault structure right. mechanisms and other things, whatever we had limited ones we have used. Okay, thank you. And I have another small question. You show the map of the ligaments, the distribution of ligaments. Your map, so there's a lot of uh, crisscrossing, you know, the, the blue lines. I wonder, are all of them actual faults? No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> you see, these are again from GSI map. We have uh, digitized it. I have not created that. It is from the geological survey. There is a uh, digitized map already given to us. So these are some of them are lineaments, some of their potential faults. You know, where if there are events falling on that, you know, even though the GSI classifies as uh, uh, lineament, but we, we we have seen that you know there are events on that lineament in the later part of the years, like in 2000 or something, because. Our maps were generated very early. So, uh, to answer your question precisely, some of them are shear zones, some of them are lineaments, some of them are faults where there was already an event occurred. So, all kinds of things are there. And also, if you note, we haven't just followed the fault distance. We have also used the gridded, gridded seismicity model. Where we don't even bother about the fault itself, you know, or lineament itself. <laughs> I but I think the effect of the actual fault could be quite different from the other other features, right? Exactly. The SHA showed that very clearly. The deterministic yeah. seismic concern very clearly showed that. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very Professor uh, Zia for his remark. How about the Professor Zia Okay, thank you. Thank you, Santana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sitaram, for your really very wonderful let me highlight particularly your I think uh, his voice is breaking. Yes, yes. Okay, Maybe you can you can request him to you can request him to close the uh, video and then yeah. you know speak. on the GMP. Yes, with huge, uh, I think with huge strong motion stations at the moment. Uh, I mean networks. So it is a it's a very uh, you know very nice. Guys, from that network issues there. I think complete network issue. Please request him to turn off his video. Maybe bandwidth will be better. Yes, that. Uh, I think GSI actually gives the seismic training and last really gives the active fault and lineaments. But active fault to my understanding. Producing earthquake. So all lineaments are not really a fault. I don't know why. Uh, uh, lineament like a copulate lineament in Northeast region, or the lineament like the Tista lineament in Eastern and she came, they are actually fault. So I think we should consider the active fault with which produce the fault and that fault are the active fault. 
So not that all lineaments are active fault. And I think your your data, your new data. Santano, I think I know I'm not able to understand anything what he says. Some sociology, I think has, I'm not able to hear uh, it. Give me a yes, are you are you able to hear me? Yes, sir, you again. If, uh, whatever professor is speaking, I'm not able to hear continuously. Yes, sir. So uh, there is some network I did not, issue. I did not get anything what he said. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because I understand. Network yes, issue. sir. Network yes, issue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe what you uh, can do is you can ask him to send that question to me yes, sure, by sure, email. Sure, sure. By email later on, and I'll try to reply yes, to you. Sure. Sir, uh, for our young researcher, they have put one question to you. They just want to know uh, what is the importance of homogenization and declustering. De de Even your uh, voice is not very clear. Arua. Sir, <laughs> our young researcher, <laughs> they want to know about the declustering of earthquake for uh, earthquake data from earthquake catalog data. So, what is the importance of declustering of uh, Africa, no, no, Africa. please don't talk simply because we cannot hear you. I cannot understand what you are saying. <laughs> now, may I request our uh, uh, Mr. Nobosti Molia to for the future course of action. Of Dr. Nobosti. Excuse, excuse me, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead, Nobosti. Sir, uh, should I give the vote of thanks? Hello. Think so. Yes, please come with the board of yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening from India. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for the event to all the dignitaries assembled here. I, Nobosity Molia, on behalf of CSI NIST uh, and entire organizing committee of International Parcel Workshop Global Seismology and Tectonics 2021, would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor T. Z. Sitaram sir. Director IIT Guwahati for such an informative presentation. Sir, your session was truly enlightening and it really helped us in understanding the scrutiny of the attenuation attributes as well as seismic evaluation of the Himalayan region. My sincere thanks goes to respected international advisor of this workshop, Dr. Andrew J. Michael Sir from USGS USA for his continuous support and guidance throughout the event. I express my same deep sense of gratitude to session advisor of our workshop. Professor Depeng Zhao from Tohoku University, Japan, and session chairman Professor J.R. Kyle, former deputy director general of GSI India, and session co-chairman co Dr. Saurabh Borwa, sir, chief scientist of CSI News, for sir for being with us and encouraging us. We are delighted to have you all with us today. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank our honorable director of CSI News, Dr. Z. Narahari Sasti, sir, for his support and cooperation. I must thank the convener of the International Barcelona Workshop, Dr. Santanu Burbasar, for giving us such an amazing platform to interact with eminent personalities in the field of seismology. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants across the globe for the active participation and all the members of organizing committee and technical staffs for the tremendous effort to make today's session a big success. With this, I thank all of you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Thank Professor you. Kayal. I will uh, actually please send me an email. I will reply to your questions. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear anything what you said. Even uh, Santanu also. Santanu, please send an email to me. I will respond to you whatever we have done. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Professor Zhao, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night to you, sir. So may I leave now?